But like Nehemiah, the wall was built despite the idle chatterers, opposition forces. Just so, Dominica shall keep rising. So I urge all members of this house to be wise and let us get every constituency to be more productive. I thank the Lord for the light over our land, the new opportunities today, and even those ahead. Glory, glory be to his holy name. I declare and decree that this budget, once approved, will be fully implemented, Mr. Speaker, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Mr. Speaker, plenty things are happening and it is so exciting. And with these few words, Mr. Speaker, I want to say, Kone Kon La, Song the Kong Shell. But Mr. Speaker, let us have a safe and enjoyable weekend as we support the Kadas Lipso Tribute Festival, Maho Festival and please. Fet Maho, Mr. Speaker. And finally, Mr. Speaker, with these few words, I fully endorse the 2022 2023 budget estimates. Yes, I recognize the Honorable Attorney General. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I support the 2022-2023 budget. And um, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. Mr. Speaker, I support the 2022-2023 budget, and I shall make a short contribution uh, to this debate. Much has been said, and pretty much every area has been covered by one contributor or another on this side, and there are a few more to go. I'm sure they will cover every other aspect. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is unfortunate and sad, really, that yet again we saw a response to the budget presented by the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, and the presentation did not reach the level that one would have hoped uh, in a democratic society where it's a two, two, two parties running, and one expects that the opposition would be presenting a viable alternative. The presentation that was presented here in response to the budget, which was presented by the Honorable Minister for Finance and Prime Minister, is woefully inadequate. Mr. Speaker, the first half, perhaps, of that presentation was spent dealing with issues of no relevance to anybody whatsoever. Indeed, from my observation where I sit here, it appears that the attempt was to pad the presentation so as to have an equal time of delivery rather than equal substance. We heard references to $100,000 for drones. How the $100,000 came about, what was the rationale for it, one doesn't know. What was the price of an individual drone, what, would, what was the number of drones that would be required, and what was the purpose and extent of the usage to be made of those drones. That's just one example, um, uh, Mr. Speaker. So all in all, Mr. Speaker, it's a, it, the, the response is what I would term as a fantasy presentation. Totally uninspiring, Mr. Speaker, and totally unhelpful to the development of Dominica and of Dominicans. Yet again, we heard that there wasn't sufficient time to prepare for the presentation. Mr. Speaker, I think every budget that I have been in this house, I have heard that or similar excuse given. The reality, as I understand it, Mr. Speaker, insofar as democratic societies are concerned, is that the party in office will present its budget and prepare and for obvious reasons, it is a party which is presenting, so it has the knowledge of when it's going to present and exactly what it's going to present in terms of the Minister of Finance. That's obvious, that's a given. 
what I understand is expected of the other side, or the opposition, is that it presents its alternative budget. So it's irrespective of what the Minister of Finance, in this instance the Prime Minister, but it could be any minister that he should choose, irrespective of what the minister who presents the budget gets up to say, the opposition should have its own budget, its own proposals, its own ideas, its own mode of seeking to give courage, encouragement, and indeed, one may say, inducement to the population to see it as an alternative government in waiting. It's not a question of sitting down and listening to what, is, what has been said by the uh, Minister of Finance and then seeking to poke holes in what that person has said without you yourself bringing any useful material to the House and to the nation. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I think in, some, in terms of that, what I will term introduction, that's perhaps enough to be said. There's been a lot said already about it, and I'm sure more will be said. But during the course of the various presentations, in particular from the opposite side, Mr. Speaker, uh, certain key uh, elements that I consider I should probably address arose. One is the issue of child abuse. Well, of course, Mr. Speaker, child abuse and the concern about child abuse is not a monopoly of the opposition. We all, I would hope, in this honorable house are concerned about child abuse and indeed every type of abuse. But this side of the house, this government, has gone beyond just speaking, Mr. Speaker, and has taken action. In 2016, the, this government, this government, as a result of its concern, enacted significant amendments to the Sexual Offences Act, taking account of concerns about child abuse and other forms of sexual impropriety. Sweeping amendments, I would say, Mr. Mr. Speaker, which had far-reaching implications. And I'm sure that the minister dealing with that particular portfolio will elaborate in due course. But, Mr. Speaker, I keep hearing people talking about legislation. Dominica has an abundance of legislation in virtually every area that you can think of. But sticking with the theme of child abuse and sticking with the theme of child sexual abuse, which has been constantly um, referred to, if everybody who has to did what they were supposed to do, I believe, Mr. Speaker, that you would not eradicate it because there'll always be divergence, but you would significantly reduce the level of sexual and other abuse in Dominica. In particular, Mr. Speaker, the, the particular amendments that I just referred to introduced mandatory reporting, a provision, Section 31A of that, the Act, whereby parents and people in local parentis, those who are in a parental position as regards minors, uh, those who work in the medical services, nurses, doctors, etc., have a legal obligation to report any suspected case of child sex abuse. It would appear, Mr. Speaker, that that is not being done, or at least not being done at the level that it should be done. There are reports of parents who, after the police have investigated uh, instances of allegations of sexual abuse, and sometimes after the police have instituted charges against individuals. There are reports of parents and others who make approaches and seek to undermine that. And indeed, even at the door of the court, seek to undermine the child giving evidence, or they themselves, where they can give or should give evidence, giving the evidence and support to the case to bring these matters uh, to the uh, conclusion that they should so that the perpetrators of this behavior can be prosecuted and justice can prevail. Um, my entreaty, Mr. Speaker, is that perhaps the uh, authorities who deal with these matters, that is to say prosecutors and indeed the courts and others in, involved in the investigatory um, process and the whole uh, criminal justice process, should become far more robust, far more aggressive 
with these individuals so that they, those who are impeding these prosecutions, are prosecuted to the fullest extent possible so that the message goes out that somebody offering you a check or whatever it may be is not an excuse for abandoning your child or the child that you are responsible for to the wiles of those who would seek to abuse them. The other area that was mentioned, Mr. Speaker, is firearms. And it's interesting that all of a sudden, members on the other, other side have arrived at an, an awakening insofar as the dangers of firearms, in particular illicit firearms, are concerned. And um, the Honourable Member has stepped out, so I, I suppose ordinarily I would not um, refer to the member if they're not there, but as a choice he, he has made. The Honourable Member for Roseau North in particular made certain comments um, in respect to firearms and the offences, which generally um, one would agree that um, we need to prosecute and take those matters seriously. But we cannot be inconsistent, Mr. Speaker. We cannot blow hot and cold in relation to these things. We cannot appear to give succor and comfort to those who engage in those types of activities on one hand, and on some occasions, encouraging um, nefarious behavior, encouraging people to break the law and to behave in a violent and aggressive manner. And on, other, on the other hand, uh, to say that we want to have law and order. We must be consistent. And I hope that we are now at a point where perhaps both sides of the House recognize that in particular, firearms are a danger to the country and to the stability and security and safety of the country. Not of those in government only, but of the country and all people. I have always said, Mr. Speaker, and when I sat on the bench as a magistrate, it's one of the things that I often said um, to those who appeared before me, is that a firearm has one purpose. It was designed to kill or cause serious injury. That's, that's, that's what it's about. That's, that's what it's about. It's not, it's not a cutlass that is designed to cut grass and you may use it for some other purpose. It is designed to kill or cause serious injury. And to that extent, Mr. Speaker, there can be no excuse insofar as I am concerned for anybody who is not lawfully or legitimately in possession of a firearm uh, to have one and to have any excuse. What do I mean by that? Mr. Speaker, what I mean is this, that the state has introduced a system whereby it authorizes certain individuals who it considers to have met certain standards to be a person fit and proper to have a firearm. Such a person, the state issues a license to them. That person may forget to renew the license, that's the financial aspect of it, the fiscal aspect, they may, for, may forget to pay that on the date that it should be paid. But that is a person that the state has deemed suitable to have a firearm in their possession. That is a wholly different matter, Mr. Speaker, from somebody who has never even presented themselves to the state to be considered whether they are appropriate to have a firearm, but they have that firearm. And in my respectful um, opinion, Mr. Speaker, uh, a person in that category, a person who has never been legitimate, legitimated in terms of having a firearm, if they are found in possession of one, in my opinion, the court may deem different. The starting point should be custody. The question should just be how long. And if and when, Mr. Speaker, the courts take that type of robust um, position, we may well find that the incidents of possession of firearm by firearms by those who are not supposed to have them may well start to decline. The idea of imposing petty fines, especially on those to whom cash is not necessarily a problem, is treated as I suggest a hazard of the job. In other words, you take insurance out um, for your car or for your house. As far as the, many of those who engage in carrying firearms without being legitimated to do so are concerned, if they get caught and they find $10,000, they probably pay it and they back out with another one from the supply and the danger for society continues. 
these people need to be removed from the streets for a period of time and hopefully during that period of time they will have a reflection and they will return to society and make a sensible contribution. That's a hope that we have because as long as we are alive, there is hope for all of us. But Mr. Speaker, there has to be virtually a no tolerance policy. It has to be a policy, in my humble opinion, of incarceration. That is what we need to protect our society from the ills and the dangers of people having firearms. Often people who are not even properly able to use those firearms and put all of us at risk. Because if we're in the wrong place at the wrong time, whether or not we're the target, we, our children, those we love, the French children, whatever, can become collateral damage to the event that these people are in. So Mr. Speaker, that is my unequivocal position on that. I think we have to take a very, very strong line on that. And I, 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 have, I am uttering it here, I've uttered it elsewhere, and I will keep uttering it um, to those who wish to listen. And I hope that attention is paid to it. I, I saw and, and heard recently that a, a, a quite significant custodial um, sentence was imposed uh, on someone in possession of a firearm. I applaud that sentence and I look forward to seeing more like that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we cannot uh, either escape the fact that society as a whole has a responsibility. And Mr. Speaker, it is not enough for us to uh, shirk our responsibility as citizens and put all of it on the police, uh, the prosecution, the courts uh, to do our job for us. We have to take our responsibility seriously. That, that involves us giving support to those around us, in particular young people, where we can, to encourage them in the right way, give them advice, give them support. Um, and, and also, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have to, where necessary, um, assist the police to take the necessary action to remove people who are a danger to society and our peace and tranquility and our, our enjoyment of the society from the streets. Mr. Speaker, I've said before and I say again, for me personally, as someone who lived for a period out of this country and returned voluntarily, not um, under uh, the impact of uh, either the, of the state uh, or where I was, um, but of a, a, a conscious choice, Mr. Speaker, um, um, and totally not a conscious choice that I would have been standing here today, but of a conscious choice to come back to Dominica as I left to go out, get an education, and improve myself, get qualification, and intending to come back. And I did come back. But, Mr. Speaker, and came back when other Dominicans, other Dominicans in the realm that I was, was of the view that I was somehow losing my mind. But Mr. Speaker, that also is part of our own um, shortcomings in terms of our own self-confidence that we have to, as a people, build ourselves up and build our nation. We have to have more belief in ourselves and what we can do. And to, to recognize that there is, there's, we are blessed in Dominica with so many things that so many other places don't have. But we, I, think, I guess we don't, we don't appreciate it. And we need to start appreciating what we have, Mr. Speaker. We have the beauty. We have a level of tranquility. And Mr. Speaker, that's how I ended up where I am speaking at this point now. Because for me, one of the major drivers in my return was this thing that they call quality of life. That doesn't have a money value, value, sorry. You can't put a money value on it. It is a quality of life, it is, it's an experience, it's an existence. And in Dominica, we have quality of life and we are in danger of squandering it. I have noticed, Mr. Speaker, over time that we are becoming less concerned about our, our neighbors, our friends, even just the common courtesies that used to exist in my younger days no longer appear to exist. People are largely materialistic and driven by things which are transient and will pass. And if you lose them tomorrow, you still have you and everything that is in you. So Mr. Speaker, I, I take the opportunity to try to encourage us as a people within this house, but also outside more broadly in, in society, to get back to the basics of courtesy and respect for each other. Simple things, Mr. Speaker, like if you're going to park, 
and you can park five feet further on or ten feet further on so that you're not obstructing everybody else, just do it. What's it going to take of you to walk five or ten yards? Um, but it's these little things that I'm noticing. Just stopping, parking anywhere, and simply unconcerned about our fellow man and woman, or brothers or sisters. Um, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, another issue that was raised during the rebuttal, if I can call it that, um, January, is the issue of um, electoral reform. Now, Mr. Speaker, I cannot believe that there's anybody in Dominica who is not aware that the government has engaged Sir Dennis Byron to undertake an exercise, some describe it as a one-man commission, some use other terms, but to undertake a thorough and complete exercise of reviewing our electoral process and presenting a detailed, comprehensive report with his recommendations as to how we can best uh, institute electoral reform uh, to hopefully benefit our electoral process. So for members on the opposite bench to come to this house yet again with the same old story about electoral reform, creating the impression that there's some resistance or opposition on this side of the house to electoral reform, uh, Mr. Speaker, is really uh, disappointing to put it um, um, in parliamentary terms. Uh, if I say what I really think, Mr. Speaker, you will tell me to leave the house, not to withdraw. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm particularly concerned because I'm well aware of the amount of effort that went into trying to draft legislation to bring about the very same electoral reform that they claim to want on more than one occasion, Mr. Speaker. And I can recall the last occasion when we got right up to the door. We were in this house, Mr. Speaker, with draft legislation, which was, had been tabled and was just ready to be debated. And what did they do? They amassed their miscreant forces to cause trouble. Bags and bags of stones and other um, um, uh, objects to cause disruption. Yeah. Members of this house had to leave this house through the back door and pass through the president's residence to depart. Mr. Speaker, and so when I hear people standing up and making contributions and claiming in pious voices that they want electoral reform and saying that in the context of a budget, a budget which, is, which has a line item which addresses an amount towards that self-same thing that they're saying they want, and rather than applaud it, they are trying to use it as a criticism and a judgment and making ridiculous comments. Mr. Speaker, I do get annoyed about it. You know, Mr. Speaker, in that same vein, when we were here, the piece of legislation that was before this House to amend the electoral legislation provided, Mr. Speaker, for identification cards. Mr. Speaker, and not just picture identification cards with a, a photo and, a, and some plastic over it. Mr. Speaker, biometric, biometric identification cards with, the, with details, individual and personalized details to make it almost impossible for somebody to impersonate. And it went further. It was providing that that was to be a mandatory requirement to be produced by everybody entering the polling booth, unless or I mean, maybe there were two or three um, um, exceptions, um, which, which were very, in very good case, somebody who hadn't received a card or one or two others. So essentially, it was a mandatory requirement unless you fell within the, 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 the few ex exceptions that, that uh, were provided for. It also provided, Mr. Speaker, for the first time and to a greater extent than before, for there to be effectively an enumeration, for officers to be appointed to go out into the community and, and basically um, do an exercise in identifying people elected to vote, and then there's a, a, a corresponding process for others who overseas who were entitled and lawfully to vote to register. So that you would have had, Mr. Speaker, the cleanse list that they claim they want. 
Mr. Speaker, so far, and it was so uh, complete in providing the necessary requirements, in fact, just for completeness and transparency, the only area that I've heard them talk about now, which seems to be a newer area, it didn't used to get as much attention as they're now giving it, is what they call campaign finance, which they seem not to understand that that is a very complicated and intricate issue of finance. And if you bring in com uh, uh, campaign finance, I don't know what is going to be said about it, but campaign finance uh, means money must come from somewhere, which means a part of it, you either have to say it's come from the Treasury, and so on and so forth. How much do you give and how do you do it? It's not a straightforward issue. That, Mr. Speaker, is the issue that wasn't addressed in that legislation, but all other aspects were addressed. And Mr. Speaker, so much so that the Honorable Member from Marigot, the leader of the opposition, actually acknowledged on the radio station that he likes to go on, that's Q95, I will say it, he acknowledged in no uncertain terms, that the government, these are his words, I'm paraphrasing of course, the government had been trying to introduce legislation to legitimize bribery and treating. But they have now gone away and they have revised it and they brought back legislation and this legislation is good for the electoral process. That's, right. That's what he said. He, said that. he, he backtracked after various people Gave him pressure on the other side. He backtracked and, and, and thought, I can play it if Mr. Speaker, if you want to have it on my phone. No, I can play it regarding. Yeah? So, Mr. Speaker, the reality is the opposition knows perfectly well that this side of the House has no difficulty with electoral reform. And that this side of the House has taken every reasonable measure that it can take to ensure that we got electoral reform, and is still doing so today. The only blockers, and I await to hear what their re response whenever the report comes forward is recommended. The only blockers are the opposition, Mr. Speaker. And the reason, in my humble opinion, they're doing so is because they want to have an issue to keep ringing a bell on to claim that there is some concern in Dominica insofar as the electoral process is concerned. That's right. That's right. And Mr. Speaker, that leads me to a comment that's made by our members um, in, on the other side. Uh, in particular, the Honorable Member for Rose North, who has scurried off and is not prepared to sit in the House and hear what may be. I would always be gentle with him, Mr. Speaker. I knew him for a long time. I knew his brother very well, his deceased brother. Uh, probably was one of the last people to speak to, to him before he met his untimely demise. So, you know, I, I, I would always have a, a, soft, a soft spot for him. But, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the other member for Rosenhoff stood up there, talked about the CCG, and he chose not merely to um, bring in the Attorney General, but to bring in somebody, Mr. Speaker, called Levi Peter. So, so, so Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm sure you'll permit me. I, I, I will not say very much, but I'm sure you'll allow me to say one or two things. Mr. Speaker, the CCJ recently ruled on a matter, which we, let, let's call the election petition matter in relation to the December 2019 elections. The opposition brought election peti petitions, as they are entitled to do by law, um, challenging the results in 10 constituencies. Matter went to the High Court, as it's supposed to do according to the law and the Constitution. The High Court judge heard the matter and as part of that legal process, and applications were made to strike out those petitions because as with virtually every petition they have filed in their existence, they have failed to meet the standards that are required. Almost every petition, I mean, Mr. Speaker, one election, you file petitions, you, you know, okay, you don't really understand the thing, and so on, you file the petition, you don't quite get it right, and so on. Okay, they throw it out. They tell you they throw it out because you're not particularizing sufficiently 
the allegations that you're making. You come to the next election. You do the same thing, it gets thrown out again. You come to the next one, you do it, it gets thrown out. Don't you learn at some point? And Mr. Speaker, on this occasion, the Toka San Kitts case with a whole set of, of, of allegations. This is my version. And I always hear people say, you know, it's opinion, it's my opinion. You can say, so everybody else has an opinion, I think I can have one too. No, my opinion, the Toka San Kitts case <laughs> called Brantley, with a whole set of allegations that was quite successful and decided, okay, we'll try that. And put in all those things and come and file that and brother it. And what happened? It got struck out. All 10 petitions were struck out in the High Court. Yet again, Mr. Speaker, that's the 2019 election. After how many those are getting it right? They went to the Court of Appeal as they're entitled to do. Again, applications were made to the Court of Appeal on the basis that they had no right to go to the Court of Appeal based on the law and the Constitution. The Court of Appeal upheld the um, submissions made uh, on behalf of the respondents, i.e. those on the government side, and the Court of Appeal said it had no jurisdiction, which indeed it had no ju jurisdiction according to the constitutional law. They took the unusual step of going to the um, CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice, because ordinarily the approach had been, uh, and the convention and, es and established wisdom was that the Court of Appeal was the end of the road in relation to election petition matters. They went to the um, CCJ, and to the extent that the CCG um, took the view or expressed the view that in fact it does have the jurisdiction to hear certain matters, um, they, one may say that they were um, successful. But the CCG, uh, Mr. Speaker, was very clear in its, in its judgment that the Court of Appeal was entirely right to conclude it had no jurisdiction and therefore it dismissed the, the um, application uh, of, for leave, special leave, from the, um, from the petitioners. That was the ruling of the CCJ. And indeed, the only issue the CCJ had to consider was that. Mr. Speaker. I think it's important because much has been said um, about this, and the government issued uh, a statement in, re in respect to it, which generated much um, discussion. The Attorney General also made a statement on DBS, which probably didn't, well, not probably, did not garner as much um, attention. But the Attorney General expressed his view in perhaps quiet terms in that, in that um, 7 a.m. contribution um, with Curtis Matthew. Those who are interested can go and try to find it. I don't know where it is because I don't tend to look for those things once I do them, but it's there. But Mr. Speaker, the significant thing is this, that, um, and let me just try to find it if you bear with me. The court said, you need to tell us exactly which document you're quoting from. Wait, Mr. Speaker, I, I will do so um, once I find yes, yes, the, no the passage. That, um, that I want to refer you to. I'm, I'm looking at, just in the meantime, I'm looking at the, at a, the judgment. Judgment of the CCJ. Um, it is for the stenographers, the um, purpose of the stenographers, it is um, CCJ application number DM slash A slash CV 2021, that's 2021 slash 002. Glenroy Coffey and others, and Melissa Scaris and others is how I will um, term it for the purposes of the exercise. And it says the critical issue in this appeal is whether the Court of Appeal rightly declined jurisdiction to review the decision of a trial judge who had dismissed 10 election petitions filed by the petitioners. That is the critical um, issue in, in the case as acknowledged by the CCJ itself. So that really 
it is what it was called upon to decide, Mr. Speaker. And in its judgment, it indicated, it stated that as follows, um, Mr. Speaker. For the reasons above stated, the petitioners must be denied permission to appeal the judgment of the Court of Appeal to this court. An appeal to this court has no reasonable prospects of success. The trial judge's judgment was interlocutory, not final, and the Court of Appeal was right to decline jurisdiction to hear an appeal against that judgment. If the court had stopped there, which is the matter it had to do with, we end the story. But it, it went on and referred to if certain allegations were true, if they were true, it would be troubling. It is that, what is known in law as that, that obiter comment of the court. So you know, as you have, uh, Mr. Speaker, racial dissidenti, which is the substance, the heart, the decision, and you have obiter, which are comments that are made, which may or may not. They're not, usually they are deemed not to have had the level of thought into them as would go into the actual decision, but they're comments made by the court. But it's those comments that has led to the issues and led to the temerity of members of the opposition coming in this house, yeah. stand up in this house and saying the CCJ is backing them. Unfortunately, if the comments hadn't been made, and I would submit uh, unapologetically that in my humble opinion, the comments need not have been made because they were, they were not issues, they are not issues that were canvassed before the court. I can, I can allege anything, I can say anything. Uh, like they said in their petitions, that in Salisbury and in Marigot, the, the, the police, um, you know, in Salisbury in particular, brought in RSS and they prevented them from doing this. Both of those areas, incidentally, they won in the election. So it, it obviously shows there is no sense in that. So in terms of the allegations, people can make any allegations. But Mr. Speaker, the reality is they brought um, actions in the High Court, they lost. They brought an action, Court of Appeal, they lost. They brought an action in the CCJ, they lost. That is the fact. The unfortunate thing is that there are aspects of, of that judgment that I suspect what we will see at the next election and beyond is it will be a consequence flowing from that, but we shall see. But I, 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 I predict that the, the same uh, audacious um, uh, approach, the bfsness of them to stand up there and, and say what they say, is, is we will see the, the consequences in, the, in, in time to come in terms of the elections that are coming up. Mr. Speaker, medicinal cannabis. Um, as mentioned briefly um, in the budget, and from the last budget coming forward, the Honorable Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, has made comments, and indeed, uh, along the way, uh, we have had amendments to the legislation to provide what um, my, my friend who deals with our foreign friends and sometimes has his lapel, uh, his lapel. I, 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 I'm not sure if he has it today, uh, Mr. Speaker, but I think, I think, I think it's, what is it, what is it called, is it Cali Reed? Is it Cali Reed? Cali Reed? Is it Cali Reed? That's old time, what's the new time, what's the new? Okay, 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 okay. Oh, okay. So, 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 Mr. Speaker, we we get it all the term, all the terms here, but, but Mr. Speaker, the the um the, the fact is that the reality reality is that the approach uh, around the world to cannabis is changing. But one of the things, particularly as it relates to medicinal cannabis, that we have to continue to make clear is that. Whilst things are changing, they have not changed. And fundamentally, they haven't changed at the international level. So we still have in place a situation where internationally, cannabis is a class A drug. That is the class of drugs that are deemed to be most dangerous. You may have a different view, I may have a different view, but that's the category that they're in at the moment. And so 
in developing an industry, we cannot ignore those facts because we don't have a sufficient population and or land mass to be able, I would suggest, to develop a medicinal cannabis industry just for the local market. Really, to be viable and, 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 and achieve what we would want to achieve in terms of the finances and revenues to us, we really need to have markets outside, which means we have to cross our borders into other people's borders, and you have to be aware of the implications uh, of that, which are the immediate implications. If you cross over into the French, French territory in terms of their sea space or air space, and they don't, you don't necessarily have the collaborative arrangements, there are consequences. If you, if you, if you go into the American space, um, and indeed, even if you don't go into the American space, even if we trade within ourselves, within the region, because all of us, I believe, if, if, uh, I, yes, if I can say I think all of us, all of us engage our banking substantially through the US, we have, we have um, relationships w w with them, that the consequence would be that we would end up having ourselves in, in a problem position. So it's something um, that has to be approached with full knowledge of all of the ramifications, all of the areas of difficulty, and you have to engage and smooth out all of those areas so that you can get the product out in the market. You also, Mr. Speaker, it would not and cannot be, and will not be able to be, um, just, you know, you just go anywhere. There, there are standards, so you, to, to get into that market, there will be, it, what we are producing, if we get to that stage, would have to be of a certain um, classification, um, uh, yes, and it will have, you know, so, so it, there will be a requirement for testing. I suppose since we like to talk about bananas, you know, when we used to ship bananas, they were, they were selectors. Um, they were quite arbitrary. They, they'd pass their knife, they'd pass their knife and just cut people's bananas. Um, this, this, this will not be quite so arbitrary a process. It, but maybe the, the other side of that is because it will be very precise and scientific in terms of the requirements, it will, it will not necessarily be easy to, to achieve and to maintain, and it will require levels of discipline that we would have to bring about in terms of um, organization. A further, a further uh, analogy, Mr. Speaker, is if you recall with the banana industry, um, well, I don't, know, I don't know, those who are old enough will remember when bananas, when you could carry the bananas, you could wrap them in trash. And I was, I was fine. And then at a certain point, I said, no, you can't use trash because it's whatever. You had to use foam. And then, then they move on, you, you, you couldn't use foam. And, and then you had, it had, you had to box them. And then you had to, you had to use, um, is it diaphin, the, the, the blue plastic yeah. on the bananas themselves. And you, you had to have some facility on the farm after a while to wash and so on. And th there, were there were consequences of all of those things for certain people in the industry because it mean, meant that certain people who didn't have, maybe their holding wasn't big enough or whatever, they would not be able. So I say all of that, Mr. Speaker, to say this, that this is the, 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 the whole medicinal cannabis um, um, uh, thrust has, I, I think, great potential. But there are challenges, and we should not expect that it's something that's going to material, materialize overnight. It's something we have to approach. Obviously, we can't spend all, li all our lifetimes, but we have to approach it recognizing the challenges uh, and that we're going to have to um, tie our wits to, to, to try to, to meet those challenges, um, Mr. Speaker. And so in, in that regard, the government has uh, established two com committees, uh, a subcommittee, a ministerial and a, and a technical um, subcommittee. And um, various, in terms of the technical subcommittee, various stakeholders have been in, in, engaged or invited to, to, to come on board, and, and many of them have. Um, there, there are a few who, who, who have not yet um, uh, engaged, uh, and, and one hopes that they will. Um, those who are, have so far engaged include uh, medical practitioners, um, people from the private sector, um, people from the religious sector, um, people from the, the youth, from the uh, um, uh, public officers and others. It's a wide cross-section of society. Um, we have had a, a, a couple of meetings, and um, we're, we're moving forward, and we are, we are being supported by Impact Justice, um, which is uh, 
original body based in, in, at Cave Hill Barbados, but, um, and you may have heard the name before, Professor Newton is the, is the coordinator of that program. He's been operating in this region for something for the past five or so years, um, largely funded by the Canadian government who have put a substantial amount of, mon of monies, um, <clears throat> several millions, well, well, tens of millions, into that, and they, um, Impact Justice have provided support in many areas um, across the region. And they are providing um, very, very useful support um, by way of involvement of Professor Newton and also some other consultants. So we are actually benefiting from the experience of some of the other jurisdictions that have already gone ahead, like um, St. Vincent and Jamaica, Antigua, St. Kitts, I believe, and, and a few others, Trinidad. Um, and Mr. Speaker, I have a, that, a document here. That document is a document prepared um, by Impacts um, and the, the consultants, which has in it comparisons of the legislation in a number of the jurisdictions that I have spoken about, and a, a, a draft uh, piece of legislation for Dominica, which is, is something I've, I've just received, so it's something we're going to have to go through um, to, to fine tune it to, to suit our particular circumstance. But Mr. Speaker, I, I say that just to say that work is taking place. Um, we have a lot to do more. Um, even in terms of meetings, there are, I mean, obviously people are uh, voluntary in, in terms of that. And, um, but, but, but Mr. Speaker, the reality is I believe that we are well placed to look into it and um, seek to allow ourselves to learn from the um, errors made by some of, our, um, some of the jurisdictions that have gone before us and to try to build on that and try to take ourselves forward. Um, so that we can have another limb, another income stream, another means by which um, people um, within the jurisdiction can earn a decent living. But also, it, it's, it's a useful purpose in terms of um, the medical, uh, our medicinal and other um, benefits that can be derived from, um, from, from cannabis, Mr. Speaker. So going forward, Mr. Speaker, um, I think we, we, are, we are taking some action, but going forward, we will have to determine the viability of, the, of that industry. We'll have to determine what option we, we, we actually take. We will have to, Mr. Speaker, enact the necessary legislation, which um, from all I understand and, and I'm advised would have to be um, focused on that industry and, and sufficiently couched to allow us to avoid the, the challenges and problems that we could get so that I've referred to earlier. And then of course, the opera, operationalization of the whole industry. Um, and I think, Mr. Speaker, that it, it's a challenge, but a challenge that we can, we can rise to. Um, and I, I look forward in um, maybe time to come that uh, some uh, greater uh, impact is reflected from this industry in our um, future national budgets. So Mr. Speaker, um, I said all of this, and I say with those few words, I wholeheartedly support the budget. Yes, Honorable Dr. Daru, I recognize you. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I too rise to give my support to the budget 2022-2023 budget before this Honorable House. But before I begin, Mr. Speaker, let me join my colleague, um, Dennis Charles, a neighbor, in offering condolences to my medical, um, my, my colleague from the medical fraternity, Dr. Addis King, and now cabinet and parliamentary colleague on the passing of uh, beloved um, Thad. Mr. Speaker, I would also like to take this opportunity to also reach out to the family and friends of Ms. Kanisha Etienne, and even to the family of the deceased gentleman who was part of this very unfortunate saga. Unfortunately, we have seen no closure to this, but we would just like to reach out to the family and friends of all involved in this unfortunate incident. I know that my colleague, um, Minister for Social Services, Dr. King, 
And of course, the Minister for Justice will soon, um, later this year, bring a suite of legislation to this parliament that will see strengthening of our child protection laws and also the dispensing of justice, the strengthening of the of his police force, and I speak of the Minister of Justice, on increasing the capacity of his force to deal with such matters, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I said before, I would like to spend a few minutes to add my voice and support to this budget. Um, although, to be honest, there's very little that I can say that haven't been said by my colleagues and speakers before me. I mean, I listened to the eloquence and brilliance of my, my friend and brother, the Minister of Works, Minister Castaneda Castaneda Laville, and also the passion of the member for the Rosa Central constituency and the, of course, always an oratory and brilliance of the member for Portsmouth and ministerial neighbor, Honorable Ian Douglas. And it leaves very little for people like myself to say, Mr. Speaker, but I think it would be remiss of me if I do not stand, take the stand to also share a few thoughts on this year's budget. Mr. Speaker, like a few speakers um, before me, um, I think it would be unfair if this budget is just looked at in isolation. It has to be looked at, Mr. Speaker, against the bad backdrop of what is happening in the world today. Um, and I speak to this ongoing war, the Russia-Ukraine war. Mr. Speaker, we are still seeing, I'm reeling from the effects of two major disasters, Mr. Speaker, Tropical Storm America in 2015 and Hurricane Maria in 2017. And while oftentimes we hear the opposition members speak to, we were using Maria and Erica, these were not dreams, Mr. Speaker. COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic was not a dream. Reality, Mr. Speaker, that the world faced, where the entire world was shut down, Mr. Speaker, for two years or more. And we're still feeling the effects. So we have to look at this um, budget, Mr. Speaker, in context of, of what happened. I speak of the two natural disasters and also what is happening. And I would like to congratulate the Honorable Minister of Finance and his team. And of course, the Honorable Minister for Economic Planning, my friend and brother, Dr. Vince Henderson, for putting together such a wonderful budget, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, some, some, just some general um, comments on the budget. I mean, when we go through the, through the different line items, Mr. Speaker, and we see all of these wonderful initiatives and programs that the government has lined up, we do have to applaud, Mr. Speaker, the efforts of each and, every, each and every member of the cabinet, Mr. Speaker, the public service, and each and every one, Mr. Speaker, who contributed towards, towards putting this, um, this wonderful, um, as I said, budget together. New infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, to the value of hundreds of millions of dollars in a post-COVID period. An international airport, Mr. Speaker, we are, we are embarking on building an international airport, Mr. Speaker. A new marina, the very big cut that the Minister of Tourism let, 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 let out of the bag, Mr. Speaker, in Portsmouth. And I visited um, the, the, the Portsmouth, Mr. Speaker, and the cottage area over the weekend. And I mean, I saw the number, Mr. Speaker, of medium size and some, a few, one or two mega yachts in the, in, in the Portsmouth Bay area, Mr. Speaker. And, and I think that this uh, marina has been much talked about. I know the honorable member for the Portsmouth constituency have, from time to time referred to the Cox and what? And Cox report? Shanklan and Cox report, Mr. Speaker, which spoke to the potential that exists in the Portsmouth area. And already, Mr. Speaker, we have seen this government capitalizing or implementing some of these areas. And I speak, of course, to the Moroccan Hotel and the five star Kempinski and Mr. Speaker resort. So the marina. Will, will, of course, add um, value and to see the dream and the potential, the true potential of this jewel of the north, the come of Portsmouth and, and realize, Mr. Speaker. Future, ongoing and future housing project, Mr. Speaker. Talking about um, line items within this year's budget. The over $100 million EC dollars road, Bagatelle to Lubia Road, Mr. Speaker, which will benefit, of course, my good friend and brother um, the, um, from the Grand Bay constituency, the Honorable Vince Henderson, because most of this road, Mr. Speaker, will be either leading to or passing through some parts of this constituency, Mr. Speaker. New investments in water. And of course, my good friend and brother, he's, he's not here today, um, the Honorable Senator Nicole Esprit. He spoke so eloquently, Mr. Speaker, and fluently because he claims it was his specialty. On the value of water, Mr. Speaker. 
And while many claim that we have 365 rivers and streams, whatever the case may be, Mr. Speaker, we know how rugged our terrain is, Mr. Speaker, and the, the, the development in our terrain is extremely expensive. So while we have 365 rivers or streams, whatever, the cost, whatever you want to call them, it costs a lot of money, Mr. Speaker, to get them from where they are to the homes, Mr. Speaker. So while we take for granted 98%, I think prior to Tropical Customer America, we had 98 or 99% coverage about portable water, Mr. Speaker, to our citizens. It costs the government and, of course, the WASCO millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker, taken from the water source, treatment, pipes, etc. Because right now, what we also saw happening, and I think um, Senator Esprit spoke, spoke of it, is that the post Erica and Maria expose the vulnerability of this old water system. Some of them decades old, Mr. Speaker, old copper pipes, etc. And and what we see happening, Mr. Speaker, today is that the WASCO and, of course, the government, by extension, is investing hundreds of millions of dollars that um, the minister um, responsible for, for water was spoke about yesterday in his presentation, replacing all of these old-time copper pipes, Mr. Speaker, investing in modern um, treatment, etc., storage, etc., storage capacity. So the cost of getting this water to our faucets, Mr. Speaker, something that we take um, for granted enjoying a nice warm bath, is costing the government millions of dollars, which is why I want to appeal to the users, Mr. Speaker, the consumers, to please pay your bill. Please pay your water bill. Look, I mean, the, 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 the little water bill that you pay every month, Mr. Speaker, is in no way sometimes, um, the minister can speak to that, can sustain the company, and the government has to subsidize a lot of time, Mr. Speaker, invest in this, in, in, in this um, undertaking. So we need to make a contribution to appreciate the tremendous effort that the government, and of course the WASCO, um, is making to get this portable water to our homes. We'd also like to applaud the government, Mr. Speaker, on its continued investments in health. And while um, we hear some of the, um, the prophets of doom and gloom, Mr. Speaker, speak to, to, um, to that, that, you know, you would swear that this is the worst place to be, Mr. Speaker, slowly but surely, and I'm sure my friend and, and colleague, the Honorable Minister for Health, will speak to it in detail. Slowly but surely, Mr. Speaker, we have seen the health sector, Mr. Developing and being modernized before our very eyes, Mr. Speaker. And there's no denying this, Mr. Speaker. No denying it. Mr. Speaker, we, we, if, you, if you go around the island, we'll, you'll see the 12 and more, more being built, modern health centers that are being built in the various communities around the island. The Dominica China Friendship Hospital. And later on in my presentation, Mr. Speaker, I will try to get the, um, to take the members of the opposition on the, on the tour around the island, Mr. Speaker, because obviously they, 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 they don't seem to be going anywhere, Mr. Speaker, maybe from their home, apparently to parliament for a few minutes, and maybe the occasional trip to Q95 to spew their, their, their usual diatribe, Mr. Speaker, because when you go around the island, Mr. Speaker, and you see all of these things happening, Mr. Speaker, you wonder why would they come here to, to pretend and try to mislead the public and nothing is happening. So I will take them on that, so Mr. Speaker, towards the end of my, towards the end of my contribution, starting in the south, all the way to the north, Mr. Speaker. So hopefully by the end of that time they will. Um... So I speak to the, I was, I was, I was um, speaking, Mr. Speaker, to the developments in health, the new Dominica China Friendship Hospital, Mr. Speaker, magnificent edifice, and not just the infrastructure, modern equipment, Mr. Speaker for the first time in the history of Dominica, an MRI machine available for services here in Dominica. Yes, yes, yes. The much talked about and often ridiculed HIFU, Mr. Hi Speaker, HIFU machine, Mr. Speaker, that obviously they did not understand what the HIFU means. Yeah, they were laughing at it, Mr. Speaker. From what I recall, it means a high intensity frequency um, ultrasound, which is a machine, which is a machine, Mr. Speaker, that can be used to diagnose and also treat what they call not so deep tumors, Mr. Speaker and non cancerous timbers, Mr. Speaker. The only one, the only one, Mr. Speaker, the only one, Mr. Speaker, in, the, in, in, in that part of the world. You with me, Mr. Speaker. So, so here we are, so here we are, Mr. Speaker, we are the prophets of Duman Gum preaching, Mr. Speaker, and we have all of these major developments, Mr. Speaker, happening, happening in health, Mr. Speaker, and upgraded CT scan at the New Dominica China Friendship Hospital. Dial dialysis unit, Mr. Speaker, an entire section devoted, Mr. Speaker, to treating um, patients with kidney or renal, renal um, disorders, Mr. Speaker. New theaters, Mr. Speaker, the Dominica China Friendship Hospital. New theaters, the Brenda Strafford Eye Care Center, 
And yes, Mr. Speaker, why it was named after Brenda Strafford? Because of, her, because of this foundation, immense contribution to, to optical care services here on Ireland. And they can go back, I think, to the 80s, Mr. Speaker, where they constructed a few health centers. I think Bagatelle, the old health center in Bagatelle, the old one that is. We have a new modern one right now. And some other health centers, Mr. Speaker. And in recognition of the effort, Mr. Speaker, the contribution towards eye care optical services here on Ireland, that this eye care center was renamed after her. And I could give a little history, and I'm sure the Minister for Health would probably am allude to that, that while it is named the Brenda Strafford, I guess center, it is part of the Dominica China Friendship Hospital. You with me? And then, um, and then we recall that the, or I would like to inform the house that the Brenda Shufford, I think they had some, some funds somewhere in the region of a million EC dollars towards developing um, the ICA center at the old hospital. Of course, Mr. Speaker, a million dollars sounds like a lot of money. I mean, myself and my friend, I'm sure Minister Blackwell can spend that probably yes. in one or one Amazon, Mr. Speaker. Yes, one million dollars, yes, easy dollars. So while, <laughs> so while I'm, <laughs> so, <laughs> so Mr. Speaker, so while one million dollars maybe might sound like a lot, like a lot of, you have to answer that, my brother. While one million dollars, Mr. Speaker, um, might sound like a lot of money, Mr. Speaker, one million dollars really, Mr. Speaker, maybe it would just be enough to put a few blocks, Mr. Speaker, and probably paint, paint up the building. So recogni recognizing, Mr. Speaker, that the new ongoing project of Dominica China's Friendship Hospital, we had discussions at, during my channel as the Minister of Health. We had discussions with the Brenda Shufford Foundation where they agreed, where they agreed that, that this money is, that this money would now be um, re, re channel, Mr. Speaker, or channel into procuring some pieces of equipment. Because this equipment that you take for granted, they're expensive. But the one piece of equipment would cost in the region maybe of 200, 300,000 US dollars, Mr. Speaker. So this is what happened. <laughs> so, so, Mr. Speaker, um, so these funds that were, that were then placed, uh, Mr. Speaker, toward the building of the, of the foundation was then used to procure equipment, some equipment, Mr. Speaker, for this foundation. And of course, part of the arrangement is that of the clinic being the after the Brenda Strafford Foundation. We see in this, this budget, Mr. Speaker, initiatives of the of procurement of agricultural produce. And again, the Minister of Agriculture and the Minister for Trade and my, my, my sister, Dennis Charles, spoke to that, that no longer will, no longer will farmers have to wait um, months, Mr. Speaker, or in some cases, never. For, for payment, Mr. Speaker, of, of their produce, Mr. Speaker. The National Abattoir, a further $2 million, Minister of Agriculture, is going to be invested, going to be invested in the National Abattoir. And again, my, my brother and friend, um, Minister, I'm sorry, Senator Esprit, I, I'm, I'm not sure if he picked up my notes yesterday before he made his presentation. Because we heard the member for Rose North, my, my, my partner, uh, not, not that your partner, um, AG, I mean, my, my good partner, so Danny Lugu, we're good enough, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, almost ridiculously, you know, the fact that the auditor report showed that we had spent more than we had earned at the Abbott, Mr. Speaker. Like this was some sort of victory for him or for them, Mr. Speaker. What is that about, Mr. Speaker? My brother, the Abbott was never, was never built, Mr. Speaker, as a source sort of revenue. And, and Senator Esprit said it quite rightly, Mr. Speaker. The idea behind the Abato was that there would be a, 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 a venue, Mr. Speaker, where, where pork and poultry in particular producers would be able to bring their animals in a clean, sanitary, Mr. Speaker, um, environmental health officer, I'm former, I don't know if he still is that, in a clean and sanitary um, environment, Mr. Speaker, to be slaughtered, and of course processed, and of course to get the public, Mr. Speaker, into the habit of trying to eat what we produce locally, Mr. Speaker. It was never, it was never, ever, ever built, Mr. Speaker, never, ever built for, pro for profit. Um, which is why the Honorable Prime Minister, a number of times, that we, we said if there's somebody who feels that they want to invest, and we're hoping, of course, that somebody in the private sector, you know, maybe somebody like yourself, Mr. Speaker, who know would take over the abattoir and, and get it to the next level, package and labeling, etc. But we, we're quite content, Mr. Speaker, to, to, to continue running the abattoir because we have the farmers bringing in their, their live um, pork, Mr. Speaker, their live pigs and their poultry, and the public um, now has fresh, locally produced um, white meat, Mr. Speaker, available, available to them, Mr. Speaker. 
seven new schools, Mr. Speaker. Seven new schools to be built in this financial year. Or at least begun, Mr. Speaker. Five primary schools, huh? Five, yes. Five primary schools. I see you on cutting edge technology. Oh, that. <laughs> no, yeah, Mr. Speaker, I, I saw people um, using um, the, 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 what they call it a small podium. But honestly, when I came to Parliament, I really thought this podium was hallowed, you know, and only reason for the Prime Minister. But I said, keep from here to there and otherwise. So I decided. But I'm good. I'm no, no, I'm impressed. I, I continue. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven new schools, Mr. Speaker, to be built in this um, in this new financial year. Five primary schools and two secondary schools, Mr. Speaker. Of the five primary schools and one of the secondary schools, we'd like to thank our friend, very good friend, Mr. Speaker, of the People's Republic of China, Mr. Speaker, for funding this school, Mr. Speaker. And I, of course, I will speak to our our foreign relations a bit later in my presentation. Five primary schools and two secondary schools, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member for Rosal North, the Goodwill Secondary School, Mr. Speaker, is carried out to be, to, to, to be built in this new financial year that much talked about. And five primary schools, and I know some of my, my colleagues there, Mr. 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 Speaker, they're very happy. And I speak to um, my, 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 my Kalinago brother, um, um, one of the schools that are going to be built in Seneco. Seneku, um, Pebush, the member of parliament for Pebush in Kalibishi, and um, my friend and brother also from, Ted, from, from the Grand Bay um, constituents in Tetmon, and also the member of parliament for Vekas in, in school in Tibo, Mr. Speaker, much needed. And of course, just truly in Bellevue Shopping, recognizing the tremendous influx of um, new residents in the Bellevue Shopping catchment area. And of course, this little two, three bed, this little two or three room story and um, facility right now really isn't cutting it for the, for the now expanded community of Bellevue Chopin. And truth be told, Mr. Speaker, I really would like to take this opportunity myself as a member of parliament for Bellevue Chopin on behalf of the, my other colleagues to really thank Mr. Speaker, the, the constituent for their, for their um, tremendous patience, Mr. Speaker, because truth be told, the current arrangement, Mr. Speaker, is really not optimal, I mean, Mr. Speaker, conducive for, for, for proper learning, and I mean, the member for Kalibishi and um, well, the member for Quebush will tell you that, um, that you know, um, the arrangement in, in, in Kalibishi and even Philip Savan, Mr. Speaker, we have some of our students at the um, former teachers' college, a few of them in the original Bellevue Chopin. So we really need to, to consolidate them, Mr. Speaker. So it's something good news to all of us that work will finally start in this financial year, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the late start, I remember when the, when the Prime Minister during his presentation mentioned it, I, I heard, I don't know if it's the, the one from, sorry, the member from... Um, Senator or the member. Either Senator or the member. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. I, I, was, I was correcting myself, you know, the Mr. Speaker. I, I, I refer to him as the other one, but that's trying to be a little funny. I'm the, 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 the elected member for Solvay, Mr. Speaker, elected, one of the few elected members on the other side, Mr. Speaker. He mentioned a core, meaning again. Mr. Speaker, we have to, we have to recognize that these are projects, truthfully, which have been on the cards for the past maybe three or four years. But again, for no fault of ours, Mr. Speaker, because as I mentioned, these five primary schools and one secondary school are going to be built by the Chinese. And this is COVID-19, Mr. Speaker. And you know, of course, we had a um, back in, in, in China, Mr. Speaker. In, back in China, we had some serious um, outbreaks of COVID and serious restrictions on traveling, et cetera, Mr. Speaker. So this is what would have held back the project. But I'm pleased to report to the House that all of the final designs have been signed on, Mr. Speaker. And we are just awaiting our friends from China to know, of course, select the contractor so we can begin work on this school, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we see a budget which maintains, which sees the state maintains all of its social programs. And I'm pretty sure, Mr. Speaker, that, um, that our citizens would understand, especially coming from the two disasters I mentioned, the, the um, COVID-19 pandemic, and even the now ongoing war, um, war with Russia and Ukraine war, our citizens will understand where if we had to cut back on some of these programs. Mr. Speaker, but we have yet, Mr. Speaker, to cut back on anyone. In fact, we see, we see some of the numbers increasing, Mr. Speaker, in terms of our over 70 and over, our um, the monthly stipend to our 70 and over, our folks under the NEP. I heard Teacher Bonnie mention the figure yesterday, Mr. Speaker, my eyes popped out, Mr. Speaker, on my head. 170,000 monthly to just the categories constituency to pay the NEP workers and the over 60 and over um, Mr. Speaker beneficiary, Mr. Speaker, the categories constituency. So we've seen the state maintain all of these social services and in some cases, 
intensified Mr. Speaker its efforts, and we really want to applaud them. And I mentioned the NEP. I have always been a very big advocate of the NEP. Honorable um, member for the Salivia and Minister. And um, I would like to invite um, members of this honorable house, Mr. Speaker, to drive through the Philip Savan and Grand Bay constituency, Mr. Speaker. Because I maintain, Mr. Speaker, if there ever is a case, what a kiss for an increase, Mr. Speaker, in the salaries, Mr. Speaker, or, 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 or wages, Mr. Speaker, of the NEP workers, the Grand Bay and the Philip Servant, Mr. Speaker, would probably be the most deserving of it. Because, I mean, these people do a tremendous job, Mr. Speaker, keeping our roads and our byways, village roads. And in fact, and some of the main streets, Mr. Speaker, the main, the main arteries to the communities, they sometimes um, um, work on them, Mr. Speaker, to keep them clean. So I really would like to really congratulate and thank and, um, my NEP workers within the constituency, Mr. Speaker, for the tremendous effort. The housing revolution continues, Mr. Speaker, in this year's budget. And we talk about, um, we talk about uh, at a time when, um, I think, Hurricane Maria, we saw 90, over 90% of our housing stock affected. And Mr. Speaker, people can say what they want. And I mean, I tell my constituents that from time to time, especially when they, when they complain, um, of course, we still have a few, I mean, we still have a few, Mr. Speaker, houses to be done. Um, I'm hoping, of course, I'm Minister for Housing, that the World Bank um, housing project can speed up a bit, Mr. Speaker, can, can speed up a bit. I think they, they're, they're a bit slow getting off the ground. But, Mr. Speaker, most, most, and I can say for the PD7 constituency, Mr. Speaker, without any fear, Mr. Speaker, without any fear of, um, what do you, what they call it? Contradiction, Mr. Speaker. That 95% of the homes, Mr. Speaker, that were repaired in the PD7 constituency were done by this government, Mr. Speaker. Because very few people, Mr. Speaker, in this part of the country, Mr. Speaker, had insurance. And even the few who had insurance policy, Mr. Speaker, we, we, we all know of the difficulties um, experienced by the, by the insurance companies. So when people talk about the one or two people who still need housing assistance, of course they will still need housing assistance, Mr. Speaker. The World Bank, Mr. Speaker, and the IMF, I think, or the World Bank, Gave us 20 or 25 years, Mr. Speaker, to get back to where we were. Just after Hurricane Maria, when they came to do the assessment, they said that Dominica is going to be in 25 or 30 or 40 more years, Mr. Speaker, to get back to, to where we were the morning before Hurricane Maria. So obviously, Mr. Speaker, there will be pockets of, of, of people and areas, Mr. Speaker, still needing assistance. There are pockets of people needing, with all the housing investment we, we've made in the Pillage 7 constituency, there are still little areas that need help, Mr. Speaker. But there is no denying, Mr. Speaker, the investment and the work that we've done in getting people back to safe and resilient housing, Mr. Speaker, post Erica and post Maria, Mr. Speaker. So when the opposition feel like they want to go all in the middle of the bush and look at some, some, sometimes some semi-vagrant people who have been living in their little shack for their whole life and come and post this on social media to try to give an indication that the government is not doing anything, Mr. Speaker, as it pertains to housing, tell them we'll and come again, Mr. Speaker. Talk to the people who, whose homes were repaired. And we heard the Prime Minister and highlighted, of course, by my good friend, um, the member for Sufria. The new phase, Mr. Speaker, the House Revolution is now, taking, is now being taken to another level, Mr. Speaker. Because we've heard the, the, um, not the cries, the comments from, from some of our young professionals or working class people that, yeah, applaud to you guys. Kudos for what you've done for the, for, for the less fortunate folks in getting them houses. What about us? Because not many of us, or some of us, a lot of us would not have had the, um, the luxury of, of being bequeathed, is the word they use in law, AJ? Um, some property, okay, from, from, from our parents. Um, neither land, neither houses, Mr. Speaker. So we really would like to start our family. Here we are, married, most times, okay, young couple, both professionals, and want to start a family, Mr. Speaker. Most times. Want to start a family. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, can I, please get, can I please get protection from my own side, please? Yes, yes. Um, Thank you. Members, members. The Honourable Minister is asking for protection. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, so this, this sector, this group of, of, of citizens, Mr. Speaker, you know, they, they've been talking to us and they, they have been applauding us for what we've done for the last 40 years, Mr. Speaker, in terms of getting them back into safe, resilient homes. But they're now asking, you know, we, we also need some attention because we, we also make a contribution towards the the, um, the country development, we pay our taxes, we pay our VAT, etc. So what's in it for us? And we have heeded, it, Mr. Speaker, to their call in a big way, Mr. Speaker. I think the project is going to start, I think, in Portsmouth, Portsmouth and Warner. 
and as we heard um, being articulated or articulated by the Honorable Prime Minister that they will now move to other parts of the country, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm very elated, Mr. Speaker, and I know the, as equally elated as my brother from the Salida constituency, my Kalinago brother, Mr. Speaker, on this new Kalinago fund, Mr. Speaker, in the Kalinago territory. Um, and this is, Mr. Speaker, as you, as you can tell from everything, my features, my year, and maybe 95% Kalinago. Yeah, and yeah, 95% Kalinago. <laughs> and my brother Black would like to say that he had some Kalinago thing, but, <laughs> but I'm very, but I'm very, <laughs> But Mr. Speaker, I'm very, I'm elated, Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy for, for the people of the Kalinago Territory. It's a fund and initiative that I've been spoken about for a number of years by other by administrations before. But it had to take this Labour Party administration, Mr. Speaker, to make it a reality, Mr. Speaker. And I'm really, 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 really I'm happy for them. And I have no doubt that the that under the stewardship of my, my brother, the, the member for the Salibel constituency, that this fund will be administrated or managed wisely, Mr. Speaker, properly. And we can look forward, of course, to this fund increasing in, of course, quantum um, in, in, in the coming years, Mr. Speaker. So I spoke to a number of the, not all, Mr. Speaker, just a few of the selected PSIP projects, Mr. Speaker, within the budget. But not just that, Mr. Speaker, within this budget, we've also managed to include some relief measures, Mr. Speaker. Imagine that. Relief measures, Mr. Speaker, you are referred to as quote-unquote goodies. At a time like this, Mr. Speaker, when people expected us to probably um, um, increase some taxes, Mr. Speaker, to, to put measures and revenue earning and measures in place for the government, we are talking about relief measures, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and I know the, the, the opposition on the other side, they like to talk about, oh, there's nothing that happened for the, for the folks. But I think it was the member for West, the minister for the Blue and Green Economy who really, who quite eloquently expressed, Mr. Speaker, all the things that we're doing that equate to putting money back in people's pocket, Mr. Speaker. So putting money back in people's pocket, as you like to say, doesn't mean that you have to pass even an envelope and give somebody some hard-earned cash, Mr. Speaker. All of the folks who are receiving housing, Mr. Speaker, the housing, the free housing, these are folks who more than likely would, would be paying rent, Mr. Speaker, thousand, maybe $1,500 monthly rent. So now this money now comes back to their pocket, Mr. Speaker, all of these measures. And we speak to the reduction of VAT on electricity, Mr. Speaker. Namely, absolutely no VAT on fuel surcharge starting August 1st, which is in a couple of days' time. The removal of charges and taxes on pleasure craft. Mr. Black, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to refer to you on this one. Removal of VAT on agricultural tools. Grants to first time home buyers. And the permanent reduction of land transfer fees, amongst others, Mr. Speaker. So in, in summary, Mr. Speaker, the board, the Prime Minister, and if I may be allowed to quote him, I'm at the risk of not being um, accused of plagiarism, in his address, and he stated, and I quote, government's core policy is to improve the circumstances of our people in good times and bad times, Mr. Speaker, close quote. So the aforementioned circumstances I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, the, the disasters and the ongoing war, etc., and I predict none in the foreseeable future, Mr. Speaker, will affect our ability to care for our citizens. You know why? Because what we do, Mr. Speaker, and I think um, the Honorable Prime Minister, again, um, he likes to quote this um, portion from the good book that says, whatever you do to the least of our brothers, Mr. Speaker. That's from the good book itself. So on that premise, Mr. Speaker, that I know that the good Lord above will continue to bless us, Mr. Speaker, in spite of all the adverse circumstances, past and current and future, will continue to bless us so we can continue to take care of our citizens, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, of course, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs point of view, um, Dominica, we know, values the right to conduct business. Um, from time to time, Mr. Speaker, sorry for that act of permission to refer to, to my little tablet from time to time. <laughs> values the right, Mr. Speaker, to conduct business and pursue opportunities in the interest of its people as a sovereign state. And, of course, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, International Business and Diaspora Relations, has as its primary mandate the task of advancing Dominica's foreign policy. This means that the ministry must ensure that it maintains a proactive existence and seek out other like-minded partners to champion our domestic interests and domestic goals, Mr. Speaker. So we have continued um, to advance Dominica's interests overseas, Mr. Speaker, in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic, which limited travel interaction. But as you know that we, we continue to use technology to advantage, Zoom and the other um, Microsoft meetings, etc. And despite the lingering effects of this pandemic, 
It was important to maintain a strong economic presence in Jamaica, especially the small island developing state. So all of these setbacks, I talk about the COVID, etc., the difference and disasters, have affected the way in which we have had to advance our foreign policy. But we continue, Mr. Speaker, to forge ahead. Mr. Speaker, as a, as a minister of the country, recognize that, that all of these um, spreads of nature, the pandemic, and we know we about this emerging monkeypox, Mr. Speaker, we are not unique to Dominica. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, that small states like ours have little choice but to plan within the context of disruption and uncertainty. So we have to make provision, Mr. Speaker, for these, for these unforeseen events. So in that context, we at the ministry have had to redefine and redesign our foreign policy to maintain a seat at the table, Mr. Speaker, and that we did. And I could highlight a number of the important um, meetings and, and conferences, Mr. Speaker, that we attended because while we are a very small country, small island developing state, Mr. Speaker, we know that it's important to have a seat at the table. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Speaker, many of us see us as probably um, attending meetings, Mr. Speaker, and attending to Dominica's um, responsibilities under international protocols, agreements, etc., cetera, or of course our foreign protocol services. But Mr. Speaker, we are much, much more than that, Mr. Speaker. And we are often referred to as sometimes the invisible and silent partner in the country's development. Because a number of these um, projects and initiatives, Mr. Speaker, you see appearing now in black and white. In this estimate, Mr. Speaker, a lot of times they start, Mr. Speaker, at the level of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whether on the initiative of the Prime Minister or myself as Foreign Affairs Minister when we travel or we attend conferences, discussions are had, Mr. Speaker. A lot of times this is where this project started. So by the time, Mr. Speaker, that the ministers, respective ministers, get to talk about it, this project would already have been cemented, signed for, etc. But a lot of the background of work, Mr. Speaker, would have been done by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Speaker. So oftentimes, yes, um, so Mr. Um, Minister Lavier can come and talk about how much, seven and something thousand dollars? So, so by the time it gets into the black and white, Mr. Speaker, it gets into the black and white. The, the respective minister, of course, speaks about it, and rightfully so. But as like I said, a lot of the background initial work would be done at the level of the Foreign Affairs. I really want to thank the, the Permanent Secretary and the staff of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for all the work that they do, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I can speak also to this um, ongoing agricultural science complex project at the um, complex building being done, Mr. Speaker, at one mile, one mile port walk. So now about this project, and I think the Minister of Education will tell you that a lot of the of the initial work, a lot of a lot of the nitty gritty, Mr. Speaker, troublesome work to get us to the point where we can start this primary school and secondary school um, with funding from our People's Republic of China, Mr. Speaker. There was a lot of back and forth, a lot of nitty gritty work, Mr. Speaker. A lot of it being coordinated and forwarded, of course, by the by the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So, Mr. Speaker, um, she um, as the um, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Foreign Affairs, sorry. Um, I would like also to, to also recognize the efforts of our late comrade, Mr. Speaker, um, the, the former member of parliament and minister of state within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with responsibility for diaspora relations. Um, our fallen comrade, Edward Regis, former member of parliament for the Grand Bay constituency, who prior to his um, untimely, well, we say untimely, but as I said, God, our, our date is appointed even before we die, um, demise. Yeah. He, 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 his premature demise, Mr. Speaker, started some tremendous work, Mr. Speaker, with our diaspora, um, our diaspora um, citizens. Because we recognize the importance, Mr. Speaker, the importance that our diaspora, um, diaspora, Mr. Speaker, citizens play in the development of Dominica. The barrier economy, remittances, etc., Mr. Speaker, to mention a number, Mr. Speaker, of our initiatives. So, Given the, the, the ongoing, well, I say ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and when travel and et cetera was very difficult, Mr. Speaker, we've now we've not seen the travel and, and moving around starting to relax. So we've reinitiated discussions with a number of our key members of the diaspora and relations in um, organizations, sorry, in, in the U.S. Um, I know Houston is a very big one and the, the other metropolitan cities, the London, et cetera. And sometime two weeks ago, we had um, a Zoom meeting and we also carry for the meeting next week to try to get, to consolidate, to get back where to where we were free, pre-COVID, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that even touch on corporate agreement, Mr. Speaker, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, from time to time engaging. And recently, for example, Minister for Green Economy, um, you know, visit to Morocco, we, we engage on, and also education, we engage on new cooperation agreement between the Kingdom of Morocco and the Commonwealth of Dominica as it pertains to cooperation in agriculture, 
education, etc., Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, as you can see, the list of our supporting role as a ministry is endless, and it relates to building, and we play a very vital role as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in building dynamic Dominica. So, it's not to put on our our suits and go to the UN or the OS, etc., Mr. Speaker. We also interact with a number of our partners to ensure that we that we play our part in building the dynamic and Dominica, Mr. Speaker. Mr. So Speaker, permit me a few minutes to just um, thank, of course, as I mentioned already, the, the entire staff of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Permanent Secretary, very hardworking Permanent Secretary and staff, and the head and staff of our overseas mission um, in, in London, um, Washington, New York, Mr. Speaker, and the UAE, United Arab Emirates, Mr. Speaker. And on this road, and on this road, Mr. Speaker, I would like to, huh? we have the Republic of Cuba, Republic of Cuba, yes, China, Mr. Speaker, all, all the others. Thank you, Honorable Henderson. Yes. To thank um, the, the members, um, the head of mission, Mr. Speaker, and the staff. And on this note, Mr. Speaker, I really would like to say a special thanks and appreciation to our acting high commissioner in our London mission, Mr. Speaker, for her tremendous um, role, Mr. Speaker, in, in getting our very own Baroness Patricia Scotland re-elected, Mr. Speaker, as the Secretary General of the, of the Commonwealth at the recent Sugar Commonwealth Federal Government meeting in Kigali, Rwanda. And while, Mr. Speaker, the, the much was upset about it nationally, um, were the opposite, had the opposite happened, that we had lost this, this our bid, Mr. Speaker, you would, you, would, you would not be here in the end of it. And I'm, I, I can tell this honorable of Mr. Speaker that it was a very tough election, getting re-elected. Um, we were up against um, probably the five biggest um, members of the, of, of, of the Commonwealth, the five biggest economies, the UK and the others. And we up, up against a very tough campaign because there was this campaign to, to out the Mr. Speaker, to prevent her from doing her accepted second, what, what, what had been almost like a given Mr. Speaker, um, a given, um, how would I put it, um, a culture, a given um, practice at the, at the Commonwealth that she do a second term. And Mr. Speaker, this victory, as, as, as low-key as it was, is very significant, Mr. Speaker. Because what it did, it cemented Dominica and our head of government, our prime minister, Mr. Speaker, our important Mr. Speaker, in the international community. So I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker, if many have grasped what I said, that we were up against five of the biggest country, Mr. Speaker. They had this orchestrative campaign to oust us. Five of the biggest economies, Mr. Speaker. And our small little population island, Little Rock, of 70,000 people, the Honorable Prime Minister Speaker, the head of the Speaker, we managed to pull through to get um, our Baroness, Mr. Speaker. So as I said, so while many tried to downplay um, the, the um, as I said, our, our the work of value in, in the International Committee, Mr. Speaker, this is yet another manifestation, Mr. Speaker. And this is just one of many. We saw, Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of the, um, of the, of the pandemic, Dominica, again Dominica, not, not one of these, what they, what they used to call them the MDCs, the Barbados and the Jamaica and the Trinidad. Dominica was the first to receive vaccines, Mr. Speaker, in the region. The first, again, Mr. Speaker, because of our, our, our relation, Mr. Speaker, with the international community. We were also one of the first to receive ventilators, and seven ventilators probably cost more than, more than diamonds, Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, from our friend, the People's Republic of China. So as I said, Mr. Speaker, this, this sort of manifestation that as much as they would like to downplay our importance or, what we, or how we see in the outside world, the outside world see our country and our leader, Mr. Speaker, as a very, 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 very strong group, Mr. Speaker. And, and no amount of diatribe or rhetoric, Mr. Speaker, is going to stop that because I just, I just um, pointed out, Mr. Speaker, a number of instances. Um, a, a number of instances. So, Mr. Speaker, um, on that note, I would just like to thank, thank our many bilateral partners, the uh, Republic of China. I mean, there's no, I mean, all of the major projects that they have. 20, 20 more minutes. So that'd be fine, Mr. Speaker. All of the major projects that they have funded over the years, the stadium, Mr. Speaker, um, infrastructure, the college, and the state house, um, the Dominica China Friendship Hospital, and we spoke about the number of others on this year's. Um, on this year's budget. And not just that, also the, in terms of helping us with our human resource capacity, Mr. Speaker, um, number of um, specialists at the Dominica, China, Friendship Hospital, etc. The Republic of Cuba, 
um, in terms of there's no denying the contribution that the Republic of Cuba has made, Mr. Speaker, to our health and education sector. Myself, I'm a very, I'm a proud, extremely proud product, Mr. Speaker, and also I'm sure my colleague, I'm Dr. Dr. King, proud product, Mr. Speaker, of the Cuban Revolution, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I tell, and I say, Mr. Speaker, uh, I say, Mr. Speaker, there's no way. I was always a very bright guy, Mr. Speaker. You know that. I mean, we went to school together. Uh, and, um, I know my partner also said that I was very bright, but he took it back right away. Um, my partner, Master, you know, I said, yeah, you took it back, you took it back. The senator, senator. Senator Master, yeah, Senator Master. Mr. Speaker, but um, seriously, um, the Republic of Cuba, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker, yes, why there, might, there can be a monetary value attached to Mr. Speaker. I don't think we can put a value on the contribution that the Republic of Cuba has made, Mr. Speaker, to countries like ourselves. And I was speaking of education and health, Mr. Speaker. I was speaking of myself, Mr. Speaker, for product. And while I was extremely bright, you know that, that I said, there's no way, there's no way, Mr. Speaker, no, no way that my poor country parents would have afforded a law, Mr. Speaker, such a medium of being a medical doctor. Because we know what the cost of, 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 of getting a medical degree, Mr. Speaker. So thanks to Cuba, Mr. Speaker, people like myself and a number of people with potential, or without the financial means, Mr. Speaker, could be somebody. And just look where I am today, Mr. Speaker. So, um, Mr. Speaker, in the area of, of health, as I said, um, the, the Republic of Cuba have also made tremendous um, contribution, Mr. Speaker, um, in terms of, in terms of um, personnel. We saw quickly they responded to our call, Mr. Speaker, in sending some 30, almost 40, um, 30 man strong members of the Henry Reeves Medical Brigade to allow us in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Speaker, to, to, to beef up our, 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 our local our local efforts there, Mr. Speaker. And we continue to, to, um, to speak, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Republic of Cuba, and we will speak at whatever forum, whatever opportunity we get, Mr. Speaker, and I want to also speak in this parliament that we continue to speak out against the injustices. We think that have been meted out a level out against the Cuban government and people. The listing of the 60-something-year-old embargo on the Cuban people, Mr. Speaker, very unjust. Um, the also removal of Cuba as a state sponsored from the state sponsored terrorism list, Mr. Speaker, among many other injustices, Mr. Speaker. The Cuban people need to now breathe, Mr. Speaker. They need to breathe and then let Cuba flourish, Mr. Speaker, like the jewel of the Caribbean, okay, that it is, Mr. Speaker. The Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, Mr. Speaker, in spite of their difficulties and, and um, internal and difficulties in recent years, Mr. Speaker, they've continued to maintain a presence here. They could have been a president, the embassy here in Dominica. I mean, knowing what they, they went through in recent times, Mr. Speaker, they could easily have said that, hey, you know, we're going to shut down and et cetera. And we really want to, we really want to applaud them, Mr. Speaker, for continuing to maintain their friendship with us. And as little as they could in recent years, that um, they continue to, to reach out to us. And we cannot forget, Mr. Speaker, the efforts at the time when things were much better with them in Venezuela. And I think we have evidence of this all over the island. Um, the, the Petrocatas, although the Hurricane Maria did a number and some of them, the Petrocata initiated, Mr. Speaker. A number of the field stations in Scott Z, Scott Z and Fort and, and a number of other villages, Mr. Speaker, the field station under the Petro under the Petro Carib initiative. So we want to thank them for for um, for continuing to be friendly for Mr. Speaker. Um, and as um, I was informed by the ambassador that things are starting to look up a little better in the in Venezuela, Mr. Speaker, and we're hoping, of course, that they can that they can get back on their feet in the quickest possible time, so we can see a better um, quality of life or conditions for the people of, of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. We have another solid partner, Mr. Speaker, the Kingdom of Morocco, the United States, United Kingdom, among many others, Mr. Speaker. The speaker might better spend a few minutes just to run through my constituents. I know, I know a number of them have uh, listening, and. Um, we have seen the successful resettlement of the Philip Server and I'm constituent, Mr. Speaker, in the Bellevue shopping area. And despite, um, in spite of many, um, the city, what they call city um, issues, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the, when they just came to Bellevue shopping, of course, or an entire village coming into an already existing village, we have seen, um, we have seen a number of these um, initial issues being resolved, Mr. Speaker, and we now see um, uh, 
a much larger, Mr. Speaker, united community. Talk about the incoming peace servant people and, of course, the original Bellevue Chopin resident. Um, complete with all amenities, Mr. Speaker, and I heard the member of Four Rosa Central speak passionately about her, her plan for the, for the Riverside Apartments. Um, we have an existing commercial center, Mr. Speaker, already. I suspect, I, I think she visited, Mr. Speaker, when she, I suspect she visited um, the commercial center in Bellevue Chopin where we have most of all of the activities she spoke about the plan, and even more, Mr. Speaker, um, we talk about Sim Streets, we've got a tailor, Mr. Speaker, Sim Streets, I'm um, a supermarket, um, I'm a spa, Mr. Speaker, so uh, beauty spa, entertainment center, we've got a lot, I'm um, a, a ram, what do you call it, a flat, Mr. Speaker, a, a few mini restaurants, we have a branch of the Rose of Credit Union here, right there, Mr. Speaker, on site, um, we also have um, a gym, um, clothing stores, Mr. Speaker, among, among a few of the laundromat, etc. So, so the so the commercial centre in Bellevue Chopin is being utilised, Mr. Speaker. Although we still have some work to do in terms of the management structure, um, I was admonished by the Honourable Prime Minister recently, but we see it serving the purpose that it was envisioned for Mr. Speaker to create an avenue for the displaced and, of course, a few of the existing um, residents in Bellevue Chopin, small small businesses. We've seen um, the, the reconstruction, Mr. Speaker, of a number of bridges and roads within the P7 constituency that was damaged throughout, I'm um, sorry, by Hurricane Maria in Fort St. Bagas, et cetera. Much publicized, and um, every time it rained, we saw the, the, deep, the deep and white gorges that the, that the waterways um, did, Mr. Speaker, um, um, during the passage of Hurricane Maria. And we know, how to, um, we know how to deal with some of this. We saw the completion of the rehabilitation of the Bagatel Water Project on the BNTF. It, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, decades old water system that was damaged during Erica and Maria, and the replacement of all of these old copper pipes, Mr. Speaker, that were eroded, etc. Construction of a new storage tank, among others. Health centers, health facilities, Mr. Speaker. Of the 12 health facilities that have been built, the 57 continent was lucky. Oh, I say, um, okay, to have received. So I received two of them, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> two of them, one at the Bagatelle, Mr. Speaker, and one at Bellevue Chopin. And I want to thank the Minister of Finance and of course the former Minister of Health, Mr. Speaker, for, for making it happen. We are the residents, we are the residents of the, the residents of the Bagatelle um, community. Very loving people, strong, loving supporters. They can now um, access, Mr. Speaker, health services in a modern, in a modern environment, modern facility. And of course, the new Bellevue Chopin to, to cater to this larger, modern, um, modern um, song of Bellevue Chopin. Sports has always been, Mr. Speaker, a passion and priority of mine as a member of parliament, and we've seen um, during my, my tenure as PAL rep, we've seen the development and modernization of a number of the facilities um, in Bagatelle and, and Pichel, Mr. Speaker, and now um, Bellevue Chopin. Um, not, and not just, Mr. Speaker, the infrastructure, but you surely have been um, the architect of a number of um, community and, and constituency leagues, Mr. Speaker. In fact, as we speak, we have the ongoing Dr. Kenneth Daru and Baffin Point Sports Club Football League, and I invite you on weekends, Saturday or Sunday, any one of you, to take a drive to the lovely community of Bagatelle to see our young, to see our young, our young folks, Mr. Speaker, engage in 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 Hamlet, um, in Hamlet against Hamlet, Mr. Speaker League. And Mr. Speaker, and this league was it is it, 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 not just I know he's tried something. And Mr. Speaker, it's not. Mr. Speaker, it's not just the naming of the league after, after Dr. Kenneth Darrow, the member of parliament, Mr. Speaker. Yours truly would have ensured that each and every one of the team, Mr. Speaker, received the full gears from top to bottom, shoes and hoods and socks, everything, Mr. Speaker, fully sponsored by yourself. So, so it's not a case of me just making a contribution of $1,000, Mr. Speaker. So when you see, when you hear the Dr. Kenneth Darrow Football League, it is the Dr. Kenneth Darrow Football League, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. I can ask some protection from my own side, please, again. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I would also like to thank um, the member of parliament for the Rosa Central constituency for a kind donation and sharing of uh, two of the um, table tennis um, set, Mr. Speaker, that was um, for effort donated by the People's Republic of China. She was very kind and gracious, Mr. Speaker, to recognizing my, my interest and passion in sports and also um, the, my, my, my investment that I made in sports. She was kind enough to donate two to the P7 constituency. So one has been one one was placed at Bellevue Chopin, being used, and also the other in, in Pichne. Very well organized, small but small, well organized community that is putting to sports, Mr. Speaker, and they're being 
there being used, Mr. Speaker. Um, in store, we saw the um, an almost seven hundred thousand um, dollar what they call um, brick water at the store land in time, Mr. Speaker. And while myself and and my colleague Minister Henderson, that ten, have ten more minutes. Mr. Speaker, maybe that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I hope that the Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs be granted an additional five minutes to complete his contribution to the budget debate. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the Honorable Dr. Kenneth Darrow be given an additional five minutes. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Honorable Minister, you are given an additional five minutes. Thank you, brothers. Um, Mr. Speaker, we spent almost seven hundred thousand dollars on the brick and water at store. But we are planning, Mr. Speaker, on going beyond this. Myself and my, my colleague, um, um, Minister, um, the member for Granby, um, who a number of his constituents also um, do fish in that area, land the fish rather in, in this area. We have again, um, we have we have re-engaged our our Japanese friends, Mr. Speaker, in the development of not just a fisheries complex but a multi-purpose marine. Um, Marine um, compound here, where we can not just see the landing of fish and ice, which and, uh, and ice production, but also tourism and recreational activity, Mr. Speaker. So we're very, we 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 are the opportunity to to to, to visit um, the Japanese ambassador to Dominica, located in Port of Spain recently, and looks positive, Mr. Speaker. And we're hoping that this is something that we can see to to fruition, Mr. Speaker, at some at some point in the near future. Um, We mentioned housing, Mr. Speaker, um, and I'm pleased to announce, and I think um, that it would do the, the, the members of parliament good to visit the housing project going on right now at Centre Grande, Mr. Speaker, to house the, this, the dislocated residents of Dubic, former Dubic, and also some more who's being built also to house some of the constituents of the Honorable um, Vince Henderson from Grande, Mr. Speaker. And again, like I've done many times before, things from because America and the original Petro Castle um, project was done to thank the then MP, my, my good friend and colleague, Honorable Justina Charles, and now, of course, the late Edward Regis, and now my good friend and brother, um, Honorable Vinny Henderson, for allowing my peeps, Mr. Speaker, rather my constituents, to settle within their geophysical space in Grand Bay, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank them for that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, as I've done, I've, I have found the, the staff of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, but I would, it, it remains to me, Mr. Speaker, if I, do not, if, if I end without, um, as I said earlier, to try to just give them, I know I have about 10 more minutes, to try to, 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 to give the opposition members a talk, Mr. Speaker, a quick talk of the island, Mr. Speaker. Because I listen to them both here in the House, in Parliament, and on the other platform, and they speak like nothing is happening around the country, Mr. Speaker. And I think probably, as I said, they probably need to leave wherever they, they spend time with and, and move around, Mr. Speaker. So I'll just give them a quick turn and feel free the, the respective members of parliament for the areas to help me if there's anything that I miss. I, I, I'm only speaking from, from what I know. We could start in the south, Mr. Speaker. And I need to go to look, Mr. Speaker, at the, as I mentioned earlier, the bridges, Mr. Speaker, that we constructed post Erica and Maria, Mr. Speaker, to, to, for, to, to reestablish them. Um, connection within, within the Bagatelle Fossil area. They need to look at the playing field and refurbished basketball court in Bagatelle. The new health center in Bagatelle, Mr. Speaker. They need, they, they need to go to Bagatelle to look at these things. They can move to Stowe Estate, Mr. Speaker, where I just mentioned the $600,000 dam brick water that we built to facilitate the landing of the, of the fishermen. And they can speak to myself or the Honorable Vin Henderson as to our plans, our future plans for this area. We can move to Grand, we don't move to Grand Bay because from store we don't move to Grand Bay and then we move to the rest of my constituency. And they can see the, the 30 something apartment, Miss Anne, um, Honorable MP. 30 something apartment right, right next to the Petrel Secondary School, Mr. Speaker. We, they, 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 can, they can go to Ted Bond and speak to the MP, Mr. Speaker, to speak about the plans of the new Ted Bond Primary School. They can go to the, to the now, to the soon to be named Edward Regis, Mr. Speaker. Um, primary school, where we spent a few million dollars, Mr. Speaker, on, re on, 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 on remodeling this, this primary school. They can move on to Pitchland, speak to the, to the sports committee in Pitchland, Mr. Speaker, as to the investment we've done in sports in, 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 in the Pitchland community, Mr. Speaker. Well, Bell Bishop, Mr. Speaker, speaks for itself. 
of the almost 400 plus homes that we build in Mr. Speaker, with the amenities and new health centers, etc. They move to Supriya from, from the Pinnacle Seven County. They can go to Supriya and speak to the two wonderful jetties that, that the Honorable Dennis Charles built in Mr. Speaker. The new health center in Scottsdale, Supriya, in, in Supriya, Mr. Speaker. The, 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 new, the new home that we did in Puri, Mr. Speaker, in Point Michel. And the two new housing development that he has there, Mr. Speaker, ongoing. They can visit Jungle Bay while there, Mr. Speaker, and to look at what some of our CDI funding have done in Jungle Bay, Mr. Speaker. Um, we move to Rosa South. That's just the period. The new health center, Mr. Speaker, in Rosa South. And the new housing that he has um, ongoing in the existing constituency, Mr. Speaker. And I'm just talking to a few of the, of the project, Mr. Speaker. To move to Rosa, go to the Riverside, I call it. River Bridge. City Breeze Apartment, Mr. Speaker, is in the city of Roseau. And talk to the very passionate, Mr. Speaker, Member of Parliament for Roseau. And, and listen to the plan, Mr. Speaker, and project that he has done and planned for the Roseau um, constituency, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Drive up the, the hard court, the, the, the courts, Mr. Speaker, the four courts at the Windsor Park, Mr. Speaker. The millions of dollars spent on, 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 re, on, on repairing the, the Windsor Park Sports Stadium. And we, heard, and we heard the commentators, Mr. Speaker, speak to that, Mr. Speaker, that the, that some, that, that the condition of this stadium, Post Maria, it's, they, were, they, they were marveling, Mr. Speaker, at our, at our recovery. Millions of dollars spent on, 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 on repairing this stadium. Drive up the back road to the Dominica China Friendship Hospital. I'm not sure if Danny has visited there, sorry. The Member of Parliament for the Road or not. And, and, and take an extensive tour, Mr. Speaker. Look, look at the quality of work, Mr. Speaker, and all of the multi-million dollar um, pieces of modern equipment that we have in here. The Brenda Strafford Eichling that we spoke about recently. They can go down to Massac, Mr. Speaker, for kids film Massac, and to look at the, at the, um, at, 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 at the only covered, Mr. Speaker, basketball, um, um, basketball, um, um, court, Mr. Speaker, on island. To Maho, to the new health center, and right next to the health center, Mr. Speaker, the multi-million dollar new Maho Primary School, Mr. Speaker. You hear me? I'm good right next to Jimmy to speak to the disaster center, Mr. Speaker. The, what do you call it? The emergency, um, regional emergency shelter, Mr. Speaker. I think that's the official name in Jimmy. Millions of dollars spent there, Mr. Speaker. Move to, to Kali Ho and, and the rest of the constituency, Mr. Speaker. And talk of the new health centers, the housing in Plasma Pier. And what's more, Mr. Speaker, George Strong, the health centers, and, and, and Campinsi Hotel, Mr. Speaker, the work done at the Carbridge. The new health center being built in, in the Honorable um, Oshis constituency. And all of the housing being done, Mr. Speaker, in, 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 in the Vegas constituency and, 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 and resource center, Mr. Speaker, and Hardcourt. Mr. Speaker, only then, well, yes, and Canada, Mr. Speaker, the new, the new that, that the Minister of Services spoke about in Canada, right? Yeah, Canada, Mr. Speaker, the extreme north of the island. We, 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 move across, we move across to Mary God, Mr. Speaker, to pay Bush. Yeah, we also have, sorry, before um, the new health center being done in, in, in Andy Bay, Mr. Speaker. And we move to Mary God. We are not one, but two health facilities were done right in the middle of the constituency of the leader of the parliamentary opposition, Mr. Speaker. And I recall, Mr. Speaker, as you rightly said, I, I remember that back in the days before the, the, the health center was built. Of course, we know the issues that that resulted in, 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 in all of this. Um, the building was built maybe in the 1910s or whenever, very old building, and, and all of the problems that ensued, Mr. Speaker. And I recall back in the days when he was a bit more friendlier, and he used to talk to some of us, you know, he would come to me, we, would have, we had discussions, I remember the Ministry of Health. As I said, back then he was a lot more friendly. He was a little friendlier back then. You know, and we had discussions, and all of the candle vigils, Mr. Speaker, what they call it, the Department of Feminage? Whatever they call it, Mr. Speaker, all of these, all of these protest action, Mr. Speaker, that they tried to instigate when this wasn't done. Have you ever heard the member from Arigot speak about coming to applaud the government for the airport? In not one, but two health facilities we've been going to. Never, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if you've heard it, but I haven't heard it, Mr. Speaker. We moved to Wesley, where all the wonderful work is going on at Wesley. La Plaine, Grand Fond, Mr. Speaker, New Health Center, housing in Grand Fond. Give me, Mr. Speaker, not one, but two. I'm housing um, facilities in the Lapland constituency, a new power state of the art, smart health center in Lapland, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, if after this tour, and I said these are some of the things that I recall off my head, I didn't really take the time to, to make an extensive list. If after, Mr. Speaker. One, if, one minute? Yes, I did, that's it, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm fine. If after this, Mr. Speaker, only then I think they might maybe relent on their cliche um, diatribe and, and, and that, 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 that they dispute every day. Mr. Speaker, after this tour of the island that I recommend for them, 
And after sitting with the respective power rep, Mr. Speaker, where they can be enlightened with the programs and, and, and initiatives that we put in place for our constituents, they still will not relent, Mr. Speaker. Trust me, Mr. Speaker, there's no hope for them. If any JV is done by you, Mr. Speaker, interpret it, there's no hope for them. Mr. Speaker, I'd like, to let, like everyone to stay safe during this long holiday weekend. It's a long holiday festive weekend. Um, long one, lots of activities and events. Fets and Ant now, Cardas Lipso, um, and of course, um, admonishing our folks, if you drink, please don't drive, and if you drive in, please don't drink, and let's all find peaceful ways, Mr. Speaker, to settle our differences so we can have an incident-free um, weekend. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I move that this Honorable House be suspended until 3 p.m. this afternoon. It has been moved and seconded that the House be suspended until 3 p.m. this afternoon. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. House stands suspended until 3 p.m. this afternoon.